All right, Steve, welcome to the Sharpening Strength Podcast. So stoked to have you on here today. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome, Dave. Thanks for having me. Excited. Yeah, and we've had a lot of good conversations on and off camera, so I have no doubts that this will be much of the same. Always good conversation once we can get together. But uh, for those that aren't as familiar with some of the stuff we've put out together in the past, I want to have you kick off things today by giving listeners an overview of your story, both personally and professionally. Sure. Uh, so personally, uh, I've been married for three years uh, in August uh, to my beautiful wife, Victoria. Uh, we have a almost 10-month-old son now. Um, we actually met in Philadelphia during my training at the end of her uh, education. And after that, we moved out to California uh, for my fellowship. And we've been out in California ever since and don't plan on leaving. Um, uh, from a professional standpoint, uh, I'm an interventional orthobiologic physician, which is something that most people probably don't really know about. Um, very basically, I treat musculoskeletal injuries, things like arthritis, rotator cuff tears, meniscus injuries, labrum injuries, as well as spine problems like disc tears, bulges, you know, uh, sciatica, degenerative disc disease, all those kind of things. Uh, but I do that without uh, using steroids and without doing surgery. So and kind of dive in a little more into that later. I'm sure it'll come up, but uh, that's kind of a very basic overview of what I do professionally. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting thinking how I got to this point uh, to, you know, what basically what led me there. And, you know, growing up, I was always very active. I played, you know, sports all through high school and in college. Um, you know, I liked the musculoskeletal system. I liked, um, you know, not only just, you know, trying to stay healthy, but also performance. Um, and, you know, I've been fortunate enough to find a path to allow me to help patients get back to that maximum performance level. And whether that's a you know, weekend warrior who wants to be able to just do stuff on the weekends with their family or friends, or whether it's you know, professional athletes trying to get that edge, um, you know, and initially, like most, well, I feel like half of the uh, athletes going into med school go, I'm going to do orthopedic surgery, because uh, that's the common thing people know about they see that's the kind of the you know the obvious uh, quote unquote uh, path to go down um, and I ended up switching gears and doing something called physical medicine rehabilitation it's also called physiatry uh, basically it's a specialty focused on uh, maximizing function and it can be from any really almost any kind of limitation whether it's neurologic musculoskeletal um, and the more I kind of got down that path through, through my training, I found out about regenerative medicine, which is, which is a big component of that interventional orthobiologics. Um, so I've kind of continued down that path and subspecialized into that area. Um, and, um, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at now. Uh, we've been in San Diego area for, uh, almost three years. It'll be three years in September. We actually... We moved uh, a month after we got married um, and, you know, a couple of big life changes all at once, um, but it's been great. We love living down here and, um, you know, met a lot of great people like Dave and um, yeah, we, we love it down here. I wonder, I wonder if that's why we connected too. my wife and I moved out to California about two weeks after we got married. So a lot, <laughs> nothing like throwing all the life changes at, at one time, right? No kidding. Yeah, but I want to want to get into a little deeper of so a lot of people going so you said a lot of people that you knew going to school more of the orthopedic surgery route the more conventional route was there something specifically that was there a flip in in mindset at some point that caused you to to want to go the more non operational route the non conventional route or was it more of a gradual build over time or what kind of led to that for you I, I think it was kind of gradual but you know as you're learning you're just soaking up so much information and sometimes it's hard to have time to to question information that you're getting and you know I would see the way that you know whether it's you know athletes in college that I was playing with uh, and then obviously getting into med school and you know seeing patients from a different perspective uh, but you know most of the time they're managed with oh we've got an acute injury um, let's do a steroid injection and get you back playing soon and the more you read about what steroids especially in the high doses can do you go, well, is that really the best way to manage um, and then all too often the the option is well let's do surgery that'll fix the problem and you know I kind of use fix in, in quotes a lot of times because um, you know as much as it may help to change symptoms in that time period afterwards uh, it's not usually a great long term fix uh, and almost always because with surgery you're either cutting things out or you're putting new things in uh, 
have some collateral issues that may not show themselves for a number of years, but it just changes the biomechanics a lot. So when I started to, to realize there was other options out there to manage these kind of conditions without um, you know, being so invasive, you know, I was like, this is pretty interesting. And the more I've, I've learned about it, um, you know, it, it's really fascinating the things that, that can be done. And, you know, just some of the anecdotal stories that I have and some of my colleagues have, um, you know, but fortunately there's been more and more research developing on this to say not only from, hey, I've got this guy that I treated that did great, but we've also got, you know, large pools of, of patients who were treated uh, and really show some, um, you know, show some actually good scientific you know, data to, to support what we see on a, on a daily basis with our patients. Yeah. And that, that long-term focus is something that I think, and we've talked about as a society is so overlooked as the people that we're seeing is so overlooked as we want, we want quick fixes. We want things to, to happen fast, but I think we don't always think about, okay, what's this going to look like in five years and 10 years and in 20 years. And especially the, the focus today of us, how do we achieve long-term health? Mm -hmm. A surgery is might give you a little, a little quicker benefit, or, or the e even the myth of of a quicker, quicker result. But yeah. that can you talk a little on how that sacrifices potentially what your life's going to look like thirty years down the road? Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the I guess probably the two most common things that I see are people that had a meniscus surgery, or they have what's called a microdiscectomy, where you have a, a bulge in your back, the disc has an injury to it, and it's pressing on a nerve. And in both of those situations you're either cutting out some of the meniscus, even though you may hear that it's a repair, you're not actually repairing it, you're just cutting that meniscus tissue away, which is a normal shock absorber inside our knee. And when you remove that tissue, that greatly increases the forces on the cartilage, on the ends of our bones. So basically it, it just causes those, those tissues to, to have a lot more stress on them. And what we know happens is in five years, you're gonna have a lot worse arthritis in that spot compared to the other knee or the opposite side of your knee, um, you know. So a lot of um, a lot of the focus, even in the in the orthopedic literature, is to save the meniscus and leave that in there as much as you can. Um, but the um, so I mean so that's something that we know happens. And and with micro discectomies, where you take out part of the disc, the there's a pretty good chance of re herniating a disc later. And even if you don't, and I'll probably talk about some stability kind of components to really our whole, our whole, our whole um, you know, musculoskeletal and orthopedic system, when you take some tissue out, you've changed the stability of that it part of the body and that causes things to, to move more and to, and to get uh, basically worn down faster. Um, so as much as they can acutely help with knee pain or pain going down the leg, um, it, it's usually a, sh a short-term fix. And, um, you know, again, kind of anecdotal stories, you know, as much as they're, they're great. I mean, I've got, you know, a couple of patients just recently that we treated and one of them, she works in, a, she's a nurse and works in an outpatient surgical center where they do lots of these kind of surgeries. And her staff was shocked that she's like, wait, you didn't have surgery. How are you doing so well? And it's only been, you know, three, four weeks since her procedure. They're like, what do you mean? What did you do? <laughs> um, so, you know, getting away from the mindset of, this is your only option and you know we've got to we've got to do surgery you got to cut that out because it's torn um you know it's it's not necessarily the the only option and it's not necessarily the best option yeah so well said and I, i've i've seen it uh, in our experience working together with with shared shared patients as well and that's kind of what i want to get into today i think and we'll circle back on a lot of these topics but for those that are maybe on the fence of if they've had a lingering injury, they're considering surgery, I want people to at least consider the other alternatives out there and, and know that surgery isn't, is rarely a home run type of thing. But for those that are listening that are more on the, they're, they're active, they want to avoid these things down the road, but maybe they don't have any acute flare ups currently, or maybe they have these nagging things that, that come and go. Cause, cause you're one of my go-to guys as it, as it relates to all things, health and fitness and said you're such a, a wealth of knowledge not just on the regenerative side of things but also just in overall healing and health and we, we've shared a lot of mutual patients that have uh, done very very well with the combination of of our exercise therapy approach and then the regenerative side of things but I know a lot of your knowledge comes from your schooling and your experience but I also want to talk on some of the daily weekly habits and routines that that you have in place and that you 
uh, speak on with your patients. Cause I think that's where a lot of people can benefit from is what can I do on a daily standpoint and a weekly standpoint to make sure I'm setting my body up for the best long-term success. Can, so can you talk a little bit on routines you personally focus on or with your, your patients and clients that uh, in terms of living a healthy lifestyle and preventing some of these things while still sure. pushing your body? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it's obviously like you were saying we work together quite a bit on patients and it's, it's great to have people that you can rely on to help with things that, that you don't do. So as much as I can spend time showing patients, you know, the, the, the rehab exercise and having someone who can really help them follow them longitudinally, you know, that's, that's really important. And that's, you know, how I've kind of built a network of people that I, that I trust to help from, you know, when my job is done, um, in that kind of short time when I do the procedure, there's a lot of long-term stuff. And the, um, you know, I think those are two important components, the, the rehabilitation and the exercises, as well as, you know, potentially needing a procedure. But like you said, there's lots of other components. And these are things, I'm sure when you do your consultations, you're diving into these, and I'm doing these when I see my patients. And I try to live it as much as I can uh, in my life. But, you know, there's, there's really, I think, kind of three main components to, um, you know, to what we need to be able to maintain, you know, as, as healthy of a position as we can, or if you have an injury to help you recover from it as best as possible. And, you know, first of all, is sleep. And it's, it's obviously lives get busy and you get, you know, kind of crazy schedules. And, you know, for me, the last 10 months, it's, it's been extra <laughs> challenging. Uh, but that's really important. If you're not getting restorative sleep, um, you tend to have more pain and you have a harder time recovering and you have a hard time you know, performing if you're able to be active. Um, you know, so that's something that, you know, I, I focus on and, and, you know, it's kind of crazy how we've shifted our, our sleep wake cycles where, you know, both my wife and I are getting up pretty early in the morning to either take care of Penn or to get to the gym and we're going to bed earlier than we used to, which kind of, I guess it's just part of getting older maybe, or maybe it's getting wiser, but, um, you know, that's something that I think we both, you know, focus on and, and see a lot of value in that. Um, you know, the next component would be, you know, nutrition and that's what we eat, but also, supplementation to augment, you know, that, that diet. And, um, you know, that's something that, you know, patients oftentimes ask me, what should my, what should I eat? What should my diet be? And, and there really is no one size fits all nutrition option for everybody. It's going to depend on, on you personally. It's going to depend on what your activity is, depending on what your goals are, depending on where you are now. Um, you know, but, you know, um, you know, we really try to, to stay as, as clean as we can and using, you know, we're fortunate living where we do to have lots of really great, you know, fresh, uh, oftentimes local options that are, that are very healthy. Um, and, you know, we take the time to, you know, to prep a lot of things so we can save our time and have more time, uh, you know, with pen and have more time to sleep because I'm not having to spend, you know, extra time every single day to, to get my you know, meals ready. Uh, and I'm also not going out over lunch and, and getting, you know, getting fast food every day. Um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, I think that is, you know, that is a good foundation from what you're putting in your body. And then, and then, you know, supplements to, you know, to kind of augment that and, and to really make sure that you're, you're covering as much as you can. And then adjusting those a little bit, depending on, you know, what acutely may be going on with you. Um, and then just the, the fitness and the activity standpoint is, is really you know, what most people are coming to both of us for is because they want to be able to do something better or with less pain. Um, you know, and I think that is something that has definitely changed for me over time. Um, you know, how I work out, what I do, I definitely have a lot more respect for the proper warm up and even kind of ramping down and cooling down afterwards. Um, and, you know, we've talked about this on, on other uh, formats, you know, with us, just me and you, but also with Casey and you know, we've kind of hammered over and over and over the importance of mechanics and form and, you know, using the muscles the way they're supposed to be used so you can do that, that activity safely and efficiently. And, and I think that that, um, you know, those three parts are really key to, to, uh, to having you feel, uh, feel as good as possible. And then, you know, if you're in a performance standpoint, um, being able to do the things that you want to do from a physical, um, you know, whether it's in the gym or whether it's, you know, playing with your family and, and, and doing things, you know, outside of uh, a structured gym. Yeah, that's all great. And that, uh, I mean, that summary is so, so spot on for a lot of things. And it's in, the, in those like two minutes, pretty much summarize all the things we should be doing. And, and I think our, our problem though, is that we can oversimplify these things. And yeah. from a, from a standpoint of 
it's it doesn't have to be complicated, but at the same time, there's much more than this isn't new information for people to to hear either. And I want to get a little more into into a few of these things. That and if we start with sleep, when you say restorative sleep, is it is it more than just adding an hour on? Are there any other sleep quality things that that you're doing or that you talk about to help prepare people for sleep? Because some yeah. people, yeah, go, uh, yeah. So I mean, I'm I'm pretty fortunate that when I go to sleep, I'm able, I, I fall asleep pretty quickly and I stay asleep. My wife, uh, she wakes up at a, you know, drop of any kind of noise. And especially with, with pen, she's kind of on alert all the time. Um, and you know, I, I see some patients and even some of my, my staff has a you know hard time sleeping, falling asleep, getting asleep. Um, and oftentimes that comes down to sleep hygiene. So, you know, whether or not that is, you know, having a routine at the end of the night, um, pulling away any kind of technology, uh, watch, not watching TV, not being on your phone right before you go to bed. I mean, that's, you know, I, I still do it. I kind of check my phone real quick as I'm going to bed, but uh, for some people, they really, their body responds to that. And, and if they don't really take that time, um, then they're not going to be getting that restorative sleep because even if they try to block an extra time to, you know, to, I'm going to go to bed earlier tonight, but you don't actually fall asleep until midnight, then, you know, that that effort is is not really you're not maximizing that because you're not actually you know getting the sleep that you're trying to get so um you know there's all kinds of sleep hygiene things that you can do and um and hopefully those things will work without having to do any kind of you know pharmaceutical or anything else because there's lots of people that uh you know are on medication help them sleep but as we talked about restorative you know they oftentimes are affecting you know, your REM cycle and you're not really getting as good a sleep as uh you know as you could be getting yeah, I think those things are are great just because if you need to rely on something to go to sleep and for some people it's medication, for some people it's alcohol, there's yep. there's different things that people use that are going to affect the quality of your sleep still. And if you're if you feel like you're getting your seven, eight hours and still not feeling rested throughout the day or not waking up rested, some of those things are things to look at. Things as simple as a routine can be can be really yeah. huge too of just preparing your body and letting your body know that, hey, this is something that every night, whether that's you know, that could be things like tea and reading. That could be things like a bath for some people. Like there's any, anything that helps calm you down a little bit at the end that is usually not technology screen focused, work right. focused can be, can be a good way to help tell your body that it's, it's time to get to sleep. Yeah. And, and kind of, as you bring work in a little bit, I mean, I think for both of us work is kind of always in the back of your mind at some point. And, and I do have some nights where I'm kind of settling down and relaxing and go, I gotta make sure I do this tomorrow. I gotta make sure I do that tomorrow. I gotta email this person. I'll just you know make a little note or I'll send an email real fast and get it done so I can move it out of my brain and I'm not thinking about it. And then I can go, okay, now I can relax and I can go to sleep without going, hey, make sure I think about this in the morning when I wake up. And that's that's, that's an extra stress that I don't need as I'm trying to, you know, to get to bed. Yeah, because then you're thinking about it all night and then that's the first thing you think about when you're waking up. And there's yeah. other things we, we might circle back to in terms of first thing in the morning, some some things that are more important. Let, let's dive right into that. Not anything, uh, so when you first wake up, what's what's uh, some good routines for, for the start of the day too to help make sure that you're prepping your body for success? Yeah, uh, most days when I'm, when I'm, first thing I get up is is I'm getting ready to go to the gym. That's the really only way that I can, I can get the workout in consistently. My afternoon schedule can be kind of crazy. And especially now, again, with, with, the, with the baby, um, if I went to the gym after, um, after work, I, I wouldn't see him at all. Um, so I, I just, you know, I, I get up in time. I, I uh, you know, get ready, go to the gym, get back. And then um, that morning routine is pretty, pretty regimented. It's not super exciting because it's kind of the same thing every day. But, um, you know, I, I, I have an, uh, kind of a, a breakfast uh, bake that I make every week that my wife and I both eat. And it's a matter of heating that up instead of having to prep anything. Um, the, you know, lunch is usually ready also, whether it's been divided up into the containers yet, but that's kind of ready to go. So I can take a little bit of, I can take a little bit of time and actually spend some time with, with Penn instead of, instead of having to worry about running around and getting, getting my meals ready. Uh, I can enjoy my coffee as I'm doing all those things. Um, and then I feel like, you know, because I worked out, I'm, my, my mind's ready to go. I'm, I'm awake and the coffee obviously helps. And I don't have a real high stress morning, even though there's lots of things going on because you know I've got a I've got a plan for it and I'm prepared for it. So I think that makes things easier in the morning, where which you know, obviously can be hectic and you're kind of running around and not really a, a great uh, you know high stress way to start the day. 
Yeah, such a good point too. And I, the the preparation, the planning for for you, and just hearing you talk about that too, is people people can mistake seeing a lot of activities of your you're working out, you're doing these things, you're up early, you're, you're active, but that doesn't mean it has to be stressful. If you're planning, if you're in that routine versus some Mm -hmm. people I know that are very stressed and they have little going on or they think they can't add any more, but that could come back to some preparation and planning things as well. Yeah. I think the more organized you are, the, the, the less stressful you can make that activity, even if you're doing it, you know, if you're, if you don't have a plan and you're kind of trying to to wing it and you go, I've got six things going on at once and you're trying to balance them all. I mean, you're not going to fall through and you're not going to do a great job with it. And even if you get the task done, you're feeling exhausted and stressed afterwards. So, um, you know, I, I, I kind of learned this, especially during, during med school, I feel like it really came up, but just as you're, as you're trying to, to learn all the things that we're going over, it's like, okay, let me step back for a second and get a plan. How am I going to try to attack this versus just going and try to, well, I got to get the work. There's so much to do. I must start on it immediately. Um, but if you take a little bit of time and get a plan, whether that's studying, whether that's, figuring out your nutrition or, um, you know, whatever it is, that little bit of of prep just makes things run smoother and you can be much more efficient with, uh, with your time. Yeah. People think they don't have the time to take a half step back to invest in putting the time forward when, with some of those things, but when that really jumps you five steps forward in some of those other areas, when you are prepared like that. Right. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you have to have low quality food or low quality coffee as we, as we know are some important things. Exactly. And from the, and just to touch on some of the nutrition side of things, I know you mentioned before, there's no one size fits all approach, but Mm -hmm. are there any general recommendations you're making in terms of when we talk uh, just overall joint health, tissue health, uh, body composition, some of those things, some general recommendations you're making for people? Yeah. I mean, I think for, for most people you can make the you can you can give some some good kind of simple guidance uh, and get most people on a pretty good track. And usually that means eating more fresh food, eating less processed food. Uh, usually means looking at your carb intake and not saying get rid of it, not saying even you know make it where you don't have any, but make sure that you're smart about what you're eating and how much you're eating and when you're eating it. Um, and you know, not being afraid to, to eat fats, depending on, you know, what their source is. You know, I, I always tell patients, you know, proteins, fats, and carbs, those are the main, you know, those are the main macronutrients, and those are all good for us, even though some of them get a bad rap. And um, you just got to be, like I said, smart with what kind of foods you're eating, uh, and which of those macronutrients, and then depending on what your goals are, you're changing the, you know, the, the, the ratio of those, and you don't have to, to track them and, and follow them and have a spreadsheet or an app or anything. But if you can get a general idea for for what you're eating and when you're eating, you're, it's going to make any of your goals as far as changing, whether it's weight or whether it's getting stronger or improving your performance, or even just make you feel a little better. You're gonna a lot of people really do notice uh, a change in how they feel when they when they make some of those, and sometimes they're they're relatively subtle changes, but with a little bit of you know kind of stepping back half a step and just getting getting a plan, uh, it just makes things. Uh, that much more effective for you. And and a lot of people do really feel that difference. Yeah, it's huge. And that's for, for a lot of people listening to it's there's, there's some higher level athletes out there, but most people are just looking to, they want to look better. They want to feel better with their day to day. They want some more energy and focus. They're, they're busy with their work and, and these changes can affect all that too. And in addition to the macronutrients too, we talk a lot about micronutrients and making sure that and that's where Steve, as you talk about just quality of food, the source of food, other mm-hmm. vegetables and those things too play such a big role in, in all that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, so I'm, I'm glad we were able to touch on some of the sleep and nutrition stuff, but want to deep dive into a little more of the fitness side of things where both of us awesome. tend to have a lot, a lot more of our experience and where I think we can uh, be of a lot of value for, for people listening. And I want to start with, the importance of prioritizing our joint and tendon health. I think that's something that uh, we both focus on from, from different angles and something that doesn't get, doesn't get focused on a lot of people's training. Training for joint and tendon health is not sexy. It's not, it's not cool. It's not something that people think about, but in terms of being able to work out harder for longer, that's one, one area I think a lot of people should be focusing on. So can, can you talk a little more on what this means for you and how this looks in, in training? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, it's, it's super important. Like you said, it's not, not super exciting, but if you have somewhat of an awareness of what you should be doing for your joint and tendon health, you're going to be able to do what you want to do a lot, a lot uh, longer and 
like you said, as you're trying to ramp up your intensity, if that's your goal, you're able to do it a lot better. Um, and you know, we talked a little bit of what well, we talked about nutrition. We didn't talk specifically about supplements, but there's lots of things that you can take for, uh, for joint health. And this could include, um, you know, things like glucosamine, chondroitin, resveratrol, uh, among lots of other things that have been shown to be positive for cartilage health, which is what the, you know, the, that's the joints that there are, you know, from one end of the bone to the next, that's what's touching. That's the cartilage and that's what gets worn down when you get arthritis. So, um, you know, from a external standpoint, those are things that you can you know, utilize to put your, put your body in a, in a position to be as healthy as possible. Uh, you know, I oftentimes recommend, and I, I, I take it daily, uh, you know, a collagen supplement, a multi-collagen that has several different types of collagen. Um, you know, type two is usually better for more specific for the cartilage, but type one and three for things like tendons and ligaments and other soft tissues which can include, um, you know, labrum, meniscus, all, some of the other areas that we've talked about before. Uh, so, you know, I think from kind of a preparation outside of the activity, uh, you know, those are easy things that, that you can add. And, you know, you may not feel a big difference when, you, when you're using those, but you can, as long as you know you're taking a good quality version of the supplement, um, you know, you're probably putting your, your, your joints and your tendons and everything in a better position to, uh, you know, to stay healthy and uh, potentially get stronger if there's, you know, an injury there. Um, but from the movement standpoint, I mean, that is, you know, again, it kind of, you, you hammer it over and over and over, but it, it's, it's how you move and, and the right mechanics and, um, you know, just really making sure that you're being smart about how much you're doing, how quick you're doing it. Um, and then obviously the, the types of movements and, you know, I think pretty universally accepted for, for tendon health, eccentric exercises is, is really important. Uh, and, and that's been shown to, to help to actually strengthen the, you know, the tendon. Um, and, and being smart with your volume is, is really one of the things that, you know, is important because as you're building that, that strength, your know, muscle can, can get stronger faster than tendons can. So, um, you know, if, if you're overloading and you go, Hey, my muscles feel great, but you're in a, you're going to increase the chance that you have an overuse, you know, tendon issue, which, um, you know, which can really slow you down and kind of get in the way of, of that progress you're trying to make. What, and, and can you talk a little more on that? What are some ways that, so with muscle being able to, to build faster than the tendons can handle, what are some specific ways that, that people can avoid that or make sure that the tendons are, are up to, up to speed with the muscles? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that as we've kind of talked about before, proper warming up and, and cooling down is going to be important and just kind of getting your body ready to, to move. That's going to, that's going to help, especially as we get older. I mean, I, this morning at the gym, it's like, I, I need a little extra time to, you know, to get moving, have things feel good. And then I was able to push through and, and, you know, had a really good workout. Um, but the, yeah, I mean, I think that's important in having some variety in how you, uh, you know, how you move and the type of activities you're doing, even if you're training the same body uh, part, you know, the way that you move and the, the way that you're challenging that joint and the muscles that cross the joint, which is, uh, you know, as we know, where the, where the muscle connects to the, to the bone is that's, that's through the tendon. And that's what's getting pulled on as that muscle tries to contract. So, um, you know, like, like I was saying, you know, volume of how much you're doing as well as the, you know, the load that you're doing and how much you're kind of stressing. Um, you know, I think both of us, when we were younger, it's like, Hey, let's just go heavy weights all the time. Um, but you know, that, you know, you're going to build the muscle, but you're going to probably over stress the, the tendons. So having some, having some higher intensity days, having some lower intensity days, varying the weight, varying the reps. I mean, um, you know, that's kind of the stuff that you obviously do all the time when you're programming for your patients, you know, making those changes, uh, and adjusting it to not only what their goals are, but also, you know, where they're at now and what they've been doing leading up to seeing you. Um, you know, because, uh, you know, a lot of people that have those goals to be doing, uh, you know, bigger activities, they want to go fast and fast and they want to get there as quick as they can, but you're going to get there a lot smoother if you, if you have a good plan and you, and you have that varied, uh, you know, volume and weight and intensity, um, rather than just kind of going full bore and then, and then being laid up for a couple of months because you hurt something. Yeah. And we see that all the time where people it's, they, they push hard, either too high intensity, trying to hold that for too long and they'll do really, they'll make some incredible progress for three months and then they'll hit a, hit some kind of overuse injury, something will come up or they'll just be mentally burned out and then they have to take a month to recover. And then, and that's just not a fun cycle to be in or, and it gives the myth of that 
you're making this progress when in reality, if intelligent programming and you're intelligently uh, waiving the intensity and in terms of day to day, week to week, month to month, and addressing some of those things, you can actually make more progress over time without those, those frustrating setbacks as well. Right. And, and one more thing just wanted to add on what you were talking to of, uh, cause I know you mentioned the, the changing, even tra- training the same part of, we look at something like, uh, a squat, for example, a back squat is going to be a little different than a, than a front squat, than an overhead squat, where it's mm-hmm. not that you can't even push, push intensity in certain ways, but making sure you're not just always hammering in one stance or one variation that could lead to some of those overuse injuries without training the, the, some of those balances. Yeah. And we were actually talking about it this morning at the gym that, you know, even the difference in a you know, high back squat versus a low back squat, and then obviously taking it further to front squat, overhead squat, that's putting different intensity on different muscles that are all being incorporated, but it's stressing some different than others. So having just even that variety, I mean, you could do, you could do squats, um, you know, a couple times a week, but challenge your body very differently and, you know, have that be a better, healthier way to train, not only, you know, whether it's quads, hamstrings, glutes, but, you know, as you're incorporating some of the upper extremity, uh, you know, with front squats, overhead squats, you know, you're able to incorporate some other muscles and get, uh, get just a different workout, even though you're kind of doing the same basic movement. And he, yeah, and that's such a good point. Even things like vary, say you're doing a bench press, varying your grip, varying the barbell versus dumbbell, all these things are not going to, unless you're, unless you're competing in a specific sport, like powerlifting or trying to compete at, you know, a high level of CrossFit, you're going to have more benefit from varying up those things. And I'd argue even in those scenarios, there's, there's benefit in changing up those grips, but unless you're trying to compete in a very specific task, you're going to have more benefit in, in switching some of those things up. Right. And, you know, we're not diving too much into the stuff we talked about with, uh, with Casey in our, in our series, but uh, just pulling in some more of those stabilizer muscles and using them a little bit differently with those variations, you know, that probably is going to make that main movement that you're, you know, say competing for, to make that much stronger because you've got the the better you know, the better use of the incorporation of those stabilizing muscles and um yeah so i mean yeah I, I think there's benefits no matter what even if your goal is a little more single focus yeah and the the stepping back from the movement too we get so caught up in that a bench to, to get stronger the bench press we have to only cha- train the bench press and there's we talk different variations there's accessory work there's core work there's other things that might not look exactly like the movement that mm-hmm. can help improve your performance in that, but also then you're simultaneously getting some of the benefits of making sure you're not overworking a specific tendon or joint that can lead to some of the problems that we see day in and day out. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think this transitions in nice too, uh, cause a lot of people, they train hard and it's, it's good to get sore. We, we like getting sore, but how do we know we're getting sore in the right areas? I think that's where a lot of people come and see, see us and, and likely you as well as they, they're not sure okay, am I, am I doing too much? Am I doing too little? What is good soreness versus bad soreness that might be setting me up for a problem down the road? Yeah. And that's one thing that, you know, I think most younger athletes and I trying to think when I had the appreciation for this, but um, yeah, there's definitely a difference in, in good sore. Like I worked out real hard versus I'm susceptible to getting injured kind of sore. Um, You know, in the old mantra, no pain, no gain. I, I think that, there needs to be a lot of clarification for me to agree to that. <laughs> Otherwise I'll say that's not really a good way to, you know, to, to go. And, um, you know, so normal muscle soreness, they, I, I can pretty much guarantee after the leg work we did today, you know, my, my hamstrings and my, and my glutes and probably my quads are going to be pretty sore. We did lots of different, and this is like you're saying, varied workouts. We did three, basically three different types of squat movements and deadlift movements, all, all varied, all different ways to, to, uh, to hit those muscles, but I, I can guarantee those muscles are going to be sore. And if you go real hard, I mean, they, they should be sore for a couple of days, but um, it shouldn't linger longer. And, you know, if you find yourself having to, you know, foam roll and stretch and do some of that kind of preparative and restorative afterwards work just all the time, and, and those muscles aren't loosening up, there's probably something that that's trying to tell you, whether that muscle is having to work too much in other situations to try to stabilize a joint that's, that's not, um, that, that's not able to function as it should. Um, or, you know, a lot of times I see people that have, uh, you know, trap and, you know, shoulder blade area symptoms or just chronic glute symptoms. They go, I wasn't even, I didn't run a lot. I wasn't doing a lot of squats. Why is my butt always sore? 
uh, usually that's a sign that something in the spine is is not firing quite right or you have a little bit of nerve irritation even if it's not the kind of traditional sciatic pain that goes all the way down the leg uh, you know it could be that component as well so if the if the recovery things that you used to be able to do aren't working as well or you're just kind of going why am i sore here this doesn't seem to make sense um, that could be you know kind of a little side signal uh, of a different problem even though you're feeling it in the muscle yeah, i want i want to talk a little more on that because i think that's something we both know the importance of and focus on and, and with our backgrounds of spine and the nervous system and and side to side imbalances asymmetries all these things that can create those things you're talking about and and maybe if we can touch a little more on so let's let's use an example of like one-sided glute pain so i think one-sided one-sided soreness or or pain discomfort is another another sign of something might not be right we shouldn't be overly sore on one side and right. can you touch a little on on how the spine plays into that because it's something we intuitively know through our background but some people yeah. don't might not understand like well if my leg's sore what does that have to do with my back right yeah and you know yeah there's there's such a, a connection you know structurally because as as we both know lots of muscles attach at the spine and or start you know one 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 part of the attachment of the spine another one could be somewhere very different so you know, people with that deep psoas front of the hip pain um, could be from the hip joint, but a lot of times that's the muscle where that, that hip flexor muscle is attaching on the front of the hip. And it may be, I mean, it could be a couple of things. So one, it could just be, you know, postural because you sit at a desk all day long and that muscle is used to being short all the time. So it doesn't like when you try to lengthen it. Um, but in the context of kind of a, a, a quiet in the background, not really being too loud, but still present back issue, um, that psoas muscle attaches throughout the lumbar spine. And I, I mentioned a couple of times now instability. And if that muscle is trying to work hard to give some stability to the spine because there's a little bit of that extra movement, then that muscle is not able to do its normal moving. It's actually having to be a stabilizer muscle in, in situations where it's not supposed to be. So, um, you know, that is a, a, the common thing that I see. And, and uh, you know, I know from your perspective, it's not always about stretching. And I completely uh, agree with that. Um, but if the, you know, if the rehab and strengthening and making sure that you're moving correctly is not, uh, is not effective, then, then that may be time to step back and go, what else, you know, structurally uh, and sometimes subtly, but what kind of structural things are going on? Um, you know, and I think that, you know, on the, con on the concept again of that unilateral, you know, symptoms, um, you know, as long as you're not a, a, a one-sided athlete, you know, whether it's pitcher, thrower, you know, anything where you kind of tend to rotate one way over and over and over, simple fix or maybe just kind of obvious fix from your standpoint would be training that opposite direction and not just over, over training one movement and, and not really kind of balancing out uh, how you train. But, but otherwise, that unilateral symptom, if those kind of things have been addressed, is probably something going on telling you that, you know, a, a nerve on one side or a joint on one side or something on one side of your, of your spine may be, um, maybe affected in a way that is, that is causing that muscle either to react reactionary, be extra tight or sore, or maybe a little bit of a nerve that's kind of telling you, Hey, I'm not really happy. We need to do something about this before I start really screaming. And for, for people that might be feeling these things where, where would you recommend them um, uh, starting in terms of maybe some self troubleshooting things? Uh, because it, it, I, I think the the clear answer, if you're really unsure and if it's been going on for long enough, definitely seek some professional help. But if yeah. it's some nagging things, how do they differentiate? Like, Oh, maybe I just did something wrong versus how do I know this might be more of a problem? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say most of the time going in to see somebody that has some expertise is good because I see patients all the time. They go, Oh yeah, I, I know how to, I know how to work out. I know how to do this. I'm like, okay, show me a squat. And like their squats terrible. Um, so, you know, you can videotape it and look at yourself, but if you can't be objective with yourself, you may need something more than that. Um, you know, but I, I think that, you know, yeah, looking at, looking yourself in the mirror, looking at, I don't want I don't want to say, people on, on, you know, social media, Instagram kind of things, because there's lots of bad examples out there, but you know, on, on places like YouTube, I know you've got a ton of great videos and instructional things. And if you can, as a person who's dealing with something, look through some of those and go, you know, I think that what they're saying and what I'm seeing them do, 
looks different than what I'm doing. Um, and if you can correct it, maybe that helps the problem go away. Um, but um, oftentimes having some professional eyes, I think do help and it, um, it, at least to give you some in, in, input and feedback on, hey, you're on the right track. You know, I wouldn't worry about it, work on this for a little while and see, see how you do. Uh, or maybe it needs a deeper dive and, and it's, like I said, a little kind of canary in the coal mine situation where you're having a little bit of, of a kind of inkling of something going on and it's not real bad yet, but if you don't address it, it, it could just become a bigger problem. Yeah, I think, I think that can't be, can't be oversaid with even, even if you have a big knowledge, even if you're a, a trainer, someone with a lot of background, a lot of experience, uh, I still seek out plenty of help from, from you, from, from Casey, from so many other that I have in my network, because I need, I, we need those outside objective things. If we get caught in our own biases that can lead us down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's super important. And, and as much as I know, you know, what my expertise is, I think, like you said, yours and Casey's are a little bit different than mine. And, and even if, even if they overlap, when I'm, when I'm training, I don't want to be having to, to be doctoring myself or, or being the, you know, the trainer myself, you know, I, I have Casey over my shoulder and he tells me whenever I'm doing something wrong or he tells me when I'm doing something right. And that feedback allows me to focus on, on just the, you know, the performance of myself being at the gym and not trying to overanalyze, you know, what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, having that network, uh, of people from us professionally, but, you know, being able to have, have patients who don't have that background, have resources they can use is going to help them to be able to, uh, you know, to, to just work out better, which is what I think everyone's goal is. Yeah, that's such a good point. I, I think movement being the glue for a lot of that too, where we talk, we've talked things like biomechanics, we've talked things like having a good coach who can see your movement. Those, those things go such a long way. And whether your goal is improving performance or whether your goal is just, Hey, I don't want to be in, in pain. That's what we have to keep coming back to is how are you moving? Cause that's going to affect what muscles are working, what joints are stabilizing, what ones yep. are getting over stress and all those things. Yeah. And how, uh, so a couple of things I want to uh, wrap up with from, from this, this side of things before we, before we transition, has your, has your training evolved? So I think people like to look for, for someone with your background of, okay, we, we both used to be athletes. We both used to push for heavier weights. How's your training evolved? Because I, you're someone who still stays active and still pushes it, but there's probably a slightly different focus than someone who's simply just crossfitting six days a week, two workouts a week. How do you find that balance and how do you, how do you still strive for uh, maintaining your fitness and, and yeah. pushing your fitness, but seeking long-term health? Yeah, I mean, I think I've learned to just work out smarter. Um, probably part of it is influenced by the patients that I see and, and people that don't know how to throttle back, especially as they get older. And, you know, they keep having these nagging injuries. And they may have end up having three or four different surgeries. And now they're trying to avoid surgery. And they're, you know, dealing with all this stuff. And like, that's not really the road I want to go down. Um, yeah, so my workout, my training has definitely changed a lot. Like you said, in, in college, it's, you know, it, it's heavy weightlifting and it's, it's sports specific stuff. Um, and then for a lot of people that are, you know, that are athletes, whether it's high school, college, whenever that ends, they're kind of like, well, well now what? <laughs> so for a number of years, it was just like, well, I'm just going to go to the gym and keep doing those same workouts. And it gets pretty boring pretty quick. Um, especially because when I first was doing that after college, um, I guess I had a phone, but it wasn't like an iPhone. So I couldn't, I couldn't spend two hours at the gym with half of it being, you know, checking my phone or doing whatever. So it gets boring when you actually have to, you know, just work out and just do, okay, and I'm going to do my, my four by five bench press today. That's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and so it's definitely transitioned. And, um, you know, I think before I got into, you know, to CrossFit, I was kind of doing some, you know, just, you know, working out and doing some intramurals periodically. And I remember actually, I think one year I pulled both of my quads because I wasn't really training very smartly. I would just, you know, I would lift and then I'd go, okay, now I'm going to go run full steam like I've been you know, actually training to run and I hadn't been. So I, that kind of learned that pretty quickly. Um, and yeah, as I've kind of transitioned to, you know, most weeks going four or five times a week uh, in the CrossFit gym. And as much as I like to push myself and I've got some, you know, really good, uh, you know, carrots to watch when I'm, uh, when I'm working out to push me, uh, I've learned to throttle back a little bit. And, you know, especially if I'm not feeling good, I'll pull back on the weight and, and, you know, as much as I want to, I want to win. I want to work out tomorrow too. So uh, sometimes it's changing the weight a little bit. Sometimes it's taking an extra couple seconds to, you know, to, to finish a part of a workout um, because 
you know, if I'm coming into work and I'm injured, that probably doesn't look look great for me from a, uh, uh, from a professional standpoint. But I want to be I want to be healthy. I want to be able to do my job, which is somewhat physical. Uh, I don't want to have any issues, you know, picking up my kid and especially running after him, which is going to be happening soon enough. Um, so I'm trying to keep that balance of you know having some intensity and having that you know kind of competitive uh, you know fire still there, uh, but just being smart about it so I can. I can do it long term versus like we've been talking about, you know, you push too hard and then you have this setback and then you got a couple months and then you push again and then you, you don't kind of learn from, you know, from some of the mistakes you made. So um, it's definitely, yeah, it, it's definitely changed quite a bit. And I, I think I'm working out a lot smarter than, uh, than I used to, um, which, which I'm pretty happy with. And that's such an important point. I think people think it has to be all or nothing. I've been there too of, well, I can either have, long-term health or I can have performance, but when we really break it down and when it's done correctly and in some of the things we're talking about, you're moving well, you're aware of your volume and intensity, you're aware of when to push, when to not, you can, you can still achieve a high level of performance, feeling good, looking good, performing well, and also some of that long-term health. And I think that's confusing for a lot of people coming to see us is they're like, well, I've been diagnosed with knee arthritis. So does that mean I shouldn't ever work out again. And, and can you touch uh, on that a little more? Yeah. I mean, that, that's something that I'm sure you see all the time. You know, people that come into my office, you know, they've got, they've got some degenerative disc disease or they've got knee arthritis and their, you know, their doc, whether it's their primary care or their ortho just basically said, well, stop doing those things. Uh, if it hurts when you hurts, when you squat or hurts when you, when you run, don't do it. And I think that's a little bit, that's a lot, but we're simplistic. Um, and, you know, first of all, you got to look at, as we talked about over and over, the biomechanics, how you're, how you're working, the loads, the volumes, all those kind of things. Um, but it's, it, you know, just because you have those things doesn't mean that they're going to be something that's going to stay with you forever. You may not always be feeling them. It's not a death sentence. It's not, well, just sit in your rocker and wait until, until you get, you know, really old. Um, you know, but you just got to be smart. Like we've been saying, you got to modify sometimes the movements. You've got to, um, you know, just, uh, you, you've got to just change a little bit of what you're doing and, and reach out to some of those resources to help you with that. But, you know, you, you just got to, it's, yeah, you got to just understand that it's not something that's going to be a limitation for you forever. Um, and, and there's lots of good options to, to help you figure out how to, how to keep the activity that you, that you want to keep, um, you know, without, uh, without continuing to aggravate that. Yeah. So well said. I know you've mentioned before too, it's, it's talking to patients about what's important to them too. And if it really is important to them to stay, stay healthy and, and stay fit and do these things without having to just give up everything, seeking someone like yourself who has some, uh, with your, between stem cell stuff and PRP and things we haven't been able to get into too much depth, but I know you have a lot of information out there on your, on your site as well, but seeking things like that, seeking things like trainers and, and PTs that know, what movement should be and how to modify around those things. There, there's nothing that says you have to give that up or even jump to surgery or injections or some of these things that relate to or end up uh, causing long-term problems more than they, they cause long-term solutions and, and finding yeah. out what that is. It requires you to experiment a little bit, to seek around, to seek some help, but, but those things are, are definitely possible and, and seeing some good improvement on if you're willing to put in that work. Yeah. And I'm sure you see this all the time, but I, I had a patient that I saw a couple of years ago, um, who, his quad tendons are pretty fried. He's a big, strong, muscly guy, probably overtrained his muscles and didn't do enough with the tendon. Um, but you know, he was going, I can't live like this. I can't, I can't work out like I want to, you know, I'm, I'm sore for several days afterwards. Those, those tendons just aren't happy. And we talked about, you know, when he's doing his squats, obviously, first of all, pulling back on the intensity a little bit until he can build back up, but talked a little about some posterior chain stuff. And he's like, wow. And I started strengthening my hamstrings and my glutes pain went away. <laughs> Um, you know, so just how you, you know, he didn't even change what he was, he didn't change the movements he was doing. He just changed how he was doing them a little bit. Um, so a lot of times, yeah, just making sure that you're moving correctly and that you're using the muscles in the right way, uh, in the right combinations that, you know, that may be all you need. Um, so yeah, definitely not a, not something that's going to be, uh, with you forever, uh, as long as you, you know, can, can do some smart, uh, smart changes. Yeah, that's such a good point too, because we have anatomical differences, we have mobility differences, we have all these things that might 
uh, force us to use certain muscles more, but that's where a good training plan, a good eye on some of those things can do just enough to, to minimize some of those imbalances and people just end up feeling better with it. Right. Cool. Steve, that's, that's been such great stuff too on the, the fitness health side of things. And I know we're wrapping up on time here. So I want to transition into uh, the last part of the, of the show here. And uh, this is something I like to touch on with a lot of the guests. Cause I think many people can, can see someone like yourself from the outside and see you a uh, business owner, doctor, successful practice, able to stay fit, beautiful family. You have all these things going for you. And it's, it's so easy to look from the outside. I think when our social media world and all these things and, and have the, the myth, the belief that, that you have it all together. And, and we've talked about this off camera too. We, we both would be the first to admit that the journey's been tough. It's not as, it's not as glorious as it, as it looks, but uh, that, that myth from the outside can be, uh, can be a deception for men that are striving to improve in their fitness, improve in their careers and, and aspiring to do some of these different things. And we don't have it all together. So I'd like, uh, if you don't mind being real with some of the people listening of, uh, what's a, a challenge you're currently going through or something you faced recently that has been a catalyst for your growth as a man? Sure. Yeah. Well, I, I think your point, I mean, I, I definitely don't feel like I have it all together. I think we're all learning as we, as we go. Um, and probably if you see somebody that you think has it all together, chances are they don't. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, this has been an interesting time for sure. Like you said, a you know, business owner, which for me is new, uh, started in March of 2020, which is a crazy time to to start running your own business. I was, uh, you know, been a physician for a number of years, stayed with the same practice, but took over ownership at the beginning of a pandemic uh, with all kinds of external things factoring into allowing my practice to run successfully. So that's been a huge challenge. So, you know, learning how to run a practice just in general on top of how to run it with all these extra components going on and deciding how to manage the practice, staying open, keeping our patients and our staff healthy, um, plus giving really good quality patient care. So that's been a huge thing to juggle um, with, you know, that's, that's all work stuff. That's even separate from, from family and, and home. So, um, you know, it really kind of forces you to, um, to, to really have a, have a plan and be able to just, you know, try to approach things in, in a, as much as you can with all the chaos going on in an organized fashion. And, um, you know, I try to be as efficient as I can with my time at work so I can separate for the most part when I'm at home. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, if, uh, yeah, I mean, and that's, that's been a huge, uh, issue for me, obviously, and, and something that I think I've managed fairly well, but uh, can always do it better. And I think that, um, you know, looking to people that have more experience and maybe a different perspective on, on, on how to do things, whether it's from the business standpoint, whether it's from, you know, how to be a good, uh, good husband, a good father, um, you know, I think looking out for those resources and, and listening to what people have to say, because, you know, it, it's a really nice change. I, I've seen a lot of, a lot of men uh, open up more and be vulnerable and talk about, you know, struggles that they've had, um, which is not easy to do. Um, but you know, that's really in my mind, a much stronger person who can do that versus someone who puts out that persona and says, I've got it all figured out. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to say that I'm weak at all. I'm not going to say that I, you know, have any things I need to work on. You know, that's, that's really not probably not being honest with yourself and it's, and it's not really helping those around you. So, um, you know, I think that is, uh, I think that's one of the biggest things for really you know, everybody, but especially men who are, you know, we've been told for forever to have this, you know, macho persona and not show any weakness and not cry and not talk about your feelings at all. But, you know, I think everybody has some level of insecurities, whether it's personally, whether it's professionally. Uh, and if you ignore those, they're, they're, <laughs> they're still there. They're not going to go away. Yeah. I really appreciate you sharing that. And that's something that all the, all the people I look up to like yourself too, are the, they, t they, they're at least open about weaknesses. They're, they're vulnerable. They're not trying to, to put on this front, like you said, of having it all together. And that's the, yeah. the people that I tend to stay away from are the ones that uh, preach that it's easy, that it's, it's simple. You just have to work harder and put away your feelings and all those things are, couldn't be further from the truth. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. 
And then, uh, so, uh, so three takeaways I want to have from the show here. I wrote down quite a few things, but some of the things that as we were talking that uh, popped into my mind, I'll have you add anything that you think at the end here too. But the, the first thing we talked about is the importance of training your joints and your tendons. So varying up your movements, your routine, managing things like form, intensity, volume, all those things to make sure that you're not pushing muscle growth over uh, sacrificing tendon and joint health, which could lead to some of those long-term injuries that we so commonly see. Uh, second thing, seeking help to get objective feedback in terms of optimizing your movement, optimizing your health, seek out people like Steve, like myself, like other people in the, in the uh, profession that can help find out what's best for your body. Cause it's hard to see that from, uh, from our own view and from our own things, even if we're doing video feedback, uh, those mm -hmm. things are super important. And, and that gets back to having a plan. Like we talked about multiple times on here. And the last thing I highlighted was, short-term fixes don't create long-term results. So we can, we can think these short-term things will, uh, will give us the, the quick fix and give us long-term results. But usually we're, we're choosing quick fix over sacrificing something in the long term. And, and those were the three things that, that popped out to me. Anything you want to add with those, Steve? No, I, I think those are great. I'm, I'm glad we kind of got into those things. And, you know, as much as we kind of make them sound like they're easy, um, just because we can recommend it or just because you may know that it's the right thing to do doesn't mean that it's that it's easy or simple. You know, it takes constant work, uh, it takes effort. Uh, but those, you know, I think if you keep those in mind, um, you're gonna be in a lot better place than uh, if you're just looking for that quick fix, or if you're just, you know, not not learning to adjust how you you know, how you train and how you work out and, and you know, you're really even throughout life out if you don't step back a little bit and kind of have a little bit of a perspective on, you know, where you're at and where you want to be. Yeah. So well said. So much good stuff. We're finishing up with our, our closing question here. So one that I'm asking all the guests and it's a little reflective question here. So let's say our hypothetical scenario, you're leaving your favorite coffee shop and you bump into younger Steve of 10 years back. So younger you asks current you for some life advice, just looking for some guidance. You only have 60 seconds to talk with him. You're on your way to an important meeting or appointment. What advice are you giving to him and what are you saying to him? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. That's tough. Um, funny thing is 10 years ago, I didn't even drink coffee. Um, somehow I made it through med school um, without drinking more than probably 10 cups for four years, which is insane. Um, but let's just say I still ran into myself. You know, it's, you know, I was, you know, I think with, with my, with being a physician and going through the training, there's so many kind of regimented steps that it's kind of this almost feels like an assembly line sometimes where you go from, you know, from, from college, from taking the MCAT and getting into med school, getting into residency, maybe getting into fellowship, getting a job, all these steps are kind of all part of the path that you have to take. Um, and the kind of interesting thing is where, where I am now, like, barely existed. I could barely do what I do now 10 years ago because it didn't, it wasn't even a thing. Um, but you know, I think the biggest kind of suggestion I would say to myself is just, you know, keep putting in the hard work, do as best you can with each step. And you really never know where your life is going to take you. You're going to find some opportunities. You're going to meet some people. Uh, you're going to learn about something new and, you know, find something that you're passionate about and, and work towards it, find a way to, to achieve that. And, um, and I think you'll be happy where you're at, you know, down the road, whether, whether it's doing, whether it's me ending up in this exact same place and the same, you know, whether it's, you know, family and, and, and work or whether, whether, you know, it's a new 10 years and something different happens. But, um, you know, I think if, I think if you work hard and, and, uh, you know, find something, like I said, I think the biggest, biggest thing is finding something that interests you, that you want to do, that you can be passionate about, because you're going to be a whole lot happier in 10 years if you do that versus if you get stuck in a job or a career or uh, you know situation that you're not happy with and then it's hard to get out of it so um, yeah just just try to uh, try to put that effort in and uh, and be open awesome stuff and I'm sure we'll look back 10 years from now and think about how crazy the last 10 years have been so when, and when sure. you're when you're following those things though the the passions and those things good things end up happening so Steve, thanks so much for coming on today. This has been absolutely awesome. Uh, where can people find you for those that are looking to reach out to you? Sure. So uh, available on social media, Instagram and Facebook at SoCal Stem Cell Doc. Um, and then you can check out my website, healthlinkmedicalcenter.com. All four words, healthlinkmedicalcenter.com. Um, and um, yeah, anybody wants to reach out, you know, I'm, I reply to DMs pretty quick on, on Facebook, on Instagram. Um, happy to answer any kind of questions and, you know, give some general guidance and we can dive deeper if you need to. 
Yeah. Be sure to take advantage of that. Steve's a, a wealth of knowledge and, and so many things. So you guys are having some problems. Make sure to reach out. He's, he's one of the first people I go to with a lot of these things. So Steve, it's been a blast. Thanks so much for coming on. Excited for people to listen in on this one. You're welcome, Dave. Had a lot of fun. Thanks. Yep.